Many engineers wondered, when we saw the success of hovercraft, whether the same principles could be applied to a vehicle running at high speeds on land. In the early days, the achievement of this seemed almost impossible and grew to problems like noise and dust. a model of a track hovercraft which is being developed as a full-scale high-speed vehicle in England at the present time. The weight of the vehicle is being carried on air cushions in the manner of a hovercraft but it's only going to float a fraction of an inch above this track beam. Now once you're clear of the surface there are only three ways known to science by which you can propel yourself along. I'm going to demonstrate these on my own levitated track in which I'm not going to use air jets, but I'm going to hang this piece of aluminium on a magnetic field. Like this. Now it's free to move in this direction. The first method of propulsion I call the shot and gun principle. If you throw material out of one end of the vehicle, the vehicle will travel in the other direction. So I've arranged a catapult on the floating sheet, and when I fire it, a missile will go one way, and the vehicle should travel in the other. Now when that's been engineered, it's called a rocket. The second method of propulsion is to use an air screw, like this. This is going to, as it were, swing its way through the air. The third method of propulsion involves the use of a very unusual kind of electric motor. First, I build into the track another strip of aluminium. Then, I bring the aluminium plate, mounted on it, a row of coils. The coils are going to be fed with electric current, so in my case, I have to use trailing wires, and I'm going to hang these on a post there. And now I can lift and propel. Now when you consider the amount of noise, pollution and air disturbance produced either by rockets or by air screws, then the amount of attention being focused on the linear motor becomes obvious. Now what is this magic linear induction motor that's going to propel the vehicle? Well, roughly it's like any ordinary electric motor such as you might find in a washing machine or a spin dryer, which if you took it apart would look something like this model. If you can imagine that it had a zip fastener along one side, and this one does, that you can unzip it and then unroll it. And do the same to the inside piece. Then you've produced your linear motor. Instead of the round and round motion of the ordinary rotary machine, you now manage to produce a sweeping travelling action in a straight line directly. And although this is obviously made of rubber and is not a real motor at all, having done the unrolling process, I can now copy this in iron and copper and make a real motor. And when I put a piece of aluminium, which is going to be the equivalent of this copper grid in the rotary machine, place it on the motor and switch on, and we see it works. It produces force without electrical connection to the moving part. Now this is not the best way to use a magnetic field because the magnetic field is going through space at the moment and we shall do much better if we make a sandwich motor using two of these as it were the bread and the aluminium plate as the filling like this.
Here are the two rows of coils which are going to fit either side of this aluminium plate. There is the sandwich and this time it's going to be the coils that are on the moving piece and the aluminium plate is going to be fixed to the ground. So here we go. I could spend years trying to discover the origin of these mystic forces of electromagnetism. But as an engineer, I haven't got time to do this. I must only concern myself with sifting the profitable from the unprofitable. And as a drive for high-speed vehicles, I think this linear motor is going to be extremely profitable. <laughs> structural engineer like myself, Professor Lathwaite's work on linear motor propulsion seemed very far removed from my own activities. But once I'd started working with the team, which was set up to develop the 300 mile an hour guided land transport vehicle, I began to realise how all engineers' problems are interrelated. A vehicle had to be produced which housed the linear induction motor. There had then to be room for the hover pads which would keep the vehicle hovering above the track and also prevent the sides of the vehicle from touching the sides of the beams. Our chief engineer at Tract Hovercraft, who coordinates all our activities, is Michael Charity. Well, this vehicle carries a one-fifth scale model of the linear motor to be used on the final vehicle. It can measure speed, and it can measure thrust, and through this box here it can select any of 220 different possible measurements. It's a very exact rig because it has to support the motor very accurately and rigidly here relative to its rail here. And so it must be very stiff and it must remain rigid even when it's moving at as much as 50 miles per hour. It's important to keep in mind while we do this work that the vehicle and the motor must finally marry together and hence the rail must fit into the track and the motor into the vehicle in a reasonable kind of way. Once we decided to have a vehicle which had linear motor propulsion and air cushion suspension, it was necessary to devise a program which would determine all aspects of the work. For instance, we needed a vehicle like this for the motor and we also needed a heat table to test the suspension. This experiment is on an air cushion suspension system. This part here represents the track, this part the vehicle. In between here and here would be a suspension system of which this is a two-dimensional slice. What happens is as air comes in through here, and through here, and feeds out to the nozzles here and here. These inward facing nozzles form an area of high pressure air across here. This part then acts like the tire of a car. In the full system on the vehicle, there would be a suspension system in this space which would act like the springs of a car, the soft part of the suspension. In the experiment, this tabletop is moved up and down like that. That causes fluctuations of pressure in here, which in turn are sensed back in this region. By knowing what happens when we test moving the tabletop, we can discover what would happen with an actual system on the vehicle.
This is a model of the vehicle on its track. You can see the rectangular track with the linear motor rails set flush in the top surface. And you can also see the spaces where the air cushion suspension units go here and across here and down here. One advantage of this shape of track with the depth greater than the width is that it's possible to react row forces on the side faces, which is better than reacting them on the top because the forces available to straighten up the vehicle do not then depend upon its height. We've completed a three mile experimental track for the vehicle to run on near Cambridge. And now we have the vehicle actually running on it, we can test all our theories in practice. Work on pre-stressed concrete beams for other engineering work gave us a lead. But we had to ensure that the beams we were going to use had a very much better finish than those used for motorways, bridge building, etc. Uh, we couldn't risk any unevenness on the surface of the beam which might interfere with the smooth passage of the vehicle. Not only had the beams to be of a special construction, but we also had to invent an easy system of laying them quickly and accurately. The result of all our work is a trap made up of hollow box beams supported by concrete piers. Each beam is absolutely straight and we achieve curves on the track by very slightly angling the beams one to another. Now, as the Harbour train will be travelling at 300 miles an hour, it obviously can't go around very tight curves, nor will it be required to do so because, where necessary, we can easily and cheaply go over obstacles rather than round them. And although each beam is 75 feet long and weighs 55 tonnes, they can be laid quickly and efficiently. So as to achieve this speed of construction, each beam is moved along the track that has already been laid and then launched into place by means of a special overhead crawler gantry. Once the beams have been laid into place on the pile, then the necessary alignment to achieve the curves is accurately made. We've really have been dealing with a most difficult type of terrain for the experimental track. We've been working in waterlogged fen country, and we've had to drive 30 foot deep piles to support the beam. Now if we can achieve success in this kind of condition, we feel very confident about laying track over any other form of terrain we're liable to meet. Now the engineering problems were sufficiently absorbing in themselves, but we had to face the economic problems as well. Obviously, we could make a track that would be perfect if one had no regard to cost. But in practice, anything we develop has also to be economically viable. So I found myself not only working alongside electrical and mechanical engineers, but also with economists as well. Happily, they were equally sympathetic to our problems as we were to theirs. Especially our commercial manager, Gerald Spear. I'm an economist. My job is really distinguishing between what is merely interesting and what is going to be useful. With a new system of transport like this, it involves a large number of questions. First of all, fairly broad ones. Is there a requirement for a high-speed transport system at all? How does it compare with railways, with improved motor cars, with aeroplanes? Are the various systems competitive? Do they help each other? How can they help each other best? When we first had the idea of track hovercraft, some long time ago, we had air cushions and that was about all. And we had to think what would drive it, what the vehicle would be supported on, quite apart from the utility of the suspension system itself. And we came very early to the conclusion that a high-speed ground transport system had to meet a number of basic requirements. It had to be silent, non-polluting, 
It has to be capable of high capacity, that's to say working in trains. It has to be capable of working in tunnels. And all these sorts of considerations pointed in one definite direction from the point of view of technology. It has to be an all-electric system. It had to be non-air breathing throughout. And it had to be an electric system relying on current collection rather than onboard generation. And these sorts of considerations fixed the basic framework for the development of the tractor hovercraft system. The vehicle's now running regularly on the track, and with each run, we achieve greater speeds. We are seeing the result of years of planning and experiment. Of course, all our theories are not going to work out exactly in practice. But at last, we will be able to study our problem on a fully working system, and once this is really in operation, we shall see a high-speed hover train as an engineering reality.